Thanks very much for coming. Glad you could tear yourself away from your lunches in time. Um, right. What am I here to talk about? What drives your development? So this is me. Introduce myself. I'm James. I've, I've worked for ThoughtWorks. I've been working for ThoughtWorks for three and a half years. Before that, I worked in a startup for 10 years. If you haven't heard of ThoughtWorks, here's a marketing slide, which I wouldn't normally spend much time on. We're quite a large company. If you're interested in ThoughtWorks, if you, you might have heard of Martin Fowler, come and talk to me afterwards. And here's some books that some of my colleagues have written down the years. In fact, I know a lot of these people. So, what am I going to talk about? Uh, what drives your development? I'll just crack on with the story. So, who is the Darlington crew? Well, here they are. Here's me. I'm not wearing that T-shirt today, unfortunately, because I had to wear it at DevOx Belgium last week, and my wife hasn't done the laundry yet. So, unfortunately, I, you know, our house is being rebuilt, so I've got to wear a different T-shirt. So, we were working away from home in Darlington, which, if you've ever been to the UK, you know that Darlington's not the most inspiring of places. And one day at work, we started talking about what drives your development. Do you do TDD? Do you do BDD? All sorts of things like that. And the conversation turned to some slightly unusual things, like I started talking about sales-driven development and marketing-driven development and things like this. And then it, it escalated and escalated. We ended up going to the pub after work, and I was typing all this into a blog post as we went along. And then eventually, I wouldn't let anybody... We were having dinner that night. I think it was somebody's birthday. And I wouldn't let us go upstairs to the restaurant until we'd finished it. And I said, no, it's got to be a whole A to Z. And there was one other rule, which was... It has to be something that you've experienced. You can't just make up stuff. You have to have a real example of when you did this at work at some point. So we went through, and here's the blog post. That's, that's my website. You know, it's a shame you probably can't see that. Yeah, it will be on the video later. So if you're interested in reading the original, it's there. And I then sent an email into one of the ThoughtWorks internal email lists about this because people said, oh, you've got to share that. So it sort of went viral inside of ThoughtWorks and people started making extra suggestions about new ones and so on. Uh, and then eventually I thought, well, maybe I can talk about it in a, in a conference just to make something out of it. So here it is. So this is the A to Z of driven developments. So A stands for, this stage is a bit small, I'm sorry, I'm getting in the way of my own slides. Perhaps I should stay over here. A is AWS development. AWS driven development is when you've recently migrated everything onto AWS and unless the thing is in the AWS marketplace, you can't do it. Absolutely AWS only. B, well, behavior driven development's a thing. Also bleeding edge development. This is when everybody in the team refuses to do anything with any technology unless it is brand new. If there's been a conference about that technology, you can't use it. Oh, but if it was an unconference, that's okay. Also, B stands for bullshit-driven development. I don't know how rude this is in other languages, but in English it's quite rude. Bullshit-driven development. One developer in your team says, oh yeah, I know that technology, it's really easy, it's totally exactly what we need. So you go, okay, yeah, you believe this person, you roll it out, you start using it. Three months later, you realize that that person was just bullshitting. That person knows absolutely nothing about this technology, but you've gone so far down the road of integrating it in that you can't get out of it. You're absolutely forced to use it. And bonus points if that person has left the company at this point, which often happens. Kafka is a repeat offender in this space. C, there's two Cs here. They're quite closely related. There's career-driven development, which is when you make choices about the so technologies you're going to use to make your career advance within that organization. Then you have, again, in America, this would be resume, but in the UK, CV-driven development, which is when you do exactly the same thing as career-driven development, but you fully intend to leave that company. Domain-driven development's a thing, but also this represents developer-driven development. This is where the developers make all the decisions about the technologies they use based on how cool and how much they're going to enjoy using those technologies. So. This happened to me in a, in, in a ThoughtWorks client some time ago. Before I joined the project, everybody decided we were going to use Clojure for all the new services. So everything new went out in Clojure, and it kept all the devs interested because they didn't want to use boring old Java. Two years later, all the devs that had learned Clojure went off to get more highly paid jobs, and then the company we were working for found it difficult to hire Clojure devs. It was great. E, 
stands for ego-driven development. That's what rock stars do. I don't approve of that. F, uh, this joke only works in the UK. I meant to take this out. I'm so sorry. That's Martin Fowler from a program called EastEnders. If you're British, you'll get the joke. But obviously, we're talking about the real Martin Fowler. Martin Fowler, Fowler-driven development. This is when everything you do is based on reading Martin Fowler's blogs. If Martin Fowler didn't blog about it, you don't do it. Conversely, when Martin Fowler does blog about it, you change, you pivot, you make sure you're doing it. And you get extra points in this one if you phone up a ThoughtWorks person that you know and ask them their opinion, their interpretation of Martin Fowler's blog post. Because, of course, you know, we talk to him all the time, obviously. <laughs> yeah. We also have failure-driven development, which is when everything you do is based on the latest production failure. You jump from one failure to the next, you roll it out, you fix it, you roll it out, it comes back, and everything is based on this whack-a-mole game of putting it down there and it pops up there. G, this is Google-driven development, very much like AWS-driven development, but obviously you're going to be using Kubernetes, aren't you? H, we've got a few for H, hypothesis-driven, that's a thing. Maybe people can't see that there, I'm so sorry, but hypothesis-driven development, it's a thing. Also, hype-driven development, but that's only the latest big thing. Also in H, again, I apologize if this is a language thing, this is a hippo in English. It's an acronym in English, it stands for the highest paid person's opinion. It's a very well-known prioritization way of deciding what you do. You get in a room with 15 to 20 people. One of those people, of course, is the highest paid person, and it's their opinion that counts. Whatever that person says is what you do. Even if that person outvotes the rest of the room 1 to 20, you do that. I and J, they come together. IntelliJ driven development. Now, this is when you go onto a new code base, you, you just hit Alt, Enter, Alt, Enter, Alt, Enter. It tells you, ooh, access to modified closure and all these things. So you take all those instructions and then you commit it and it looks like you've done loads of changes. Well, IntelliJ did them. Uh, it's also known as Alt, Enter, driven development. And J, well, it's the same thing, JetBrains driven development. K, KISS, we'll keep that one simple. Also, we have Kangaroo driven development. Kangaroo-driven development, this is where you bounce from one priority to the next because your, your product owner, you either have no product owner or your product owner isn't very good at what they do and is being pulled this way and that. You bounce from this priority to that priority to that priority. You don't really know what your purpose is as a group. L, what a lovely picture that is. This is lifestyle-driven development. Now, I think we've all been involved in arguments, or let's call them discussions, where you spend a long, long time deciding whether you have three spaces or four spaces in your indents at the start of your lines, whether the curly brace should go with the method name or the line below. Those are lifestyle choices. As a tech lead, I don't care. You may end up in edit wars in your, in your Git. Just I let other people get on with that. That's a lifestyle choice. I don't care. M. What we have is marketing. You might recognize this slide earlier. It's the ThoughtWorks marketing slide. Marketing-driven development. Now, this is, and this has happened to me loads, where the marketing department come in and tell you, well, we've got this massive marketing campaign starting on this date. You have to get it done by then. They didn't ask you beforehand. They just went and booked it. So you're totally driven by that. M's also stands for, written down here, is Moscow. That's a prioritization method. That's actually quite a good thing. It stands for must, should, could, would. That's a thing. What are we up to? We are up to N. N in English stands for negativity. Negativity-driven development is when you start a new product. Everybody probably starts off quite happy. But then there's one person in the group who says, no, no, we need to test this, we need to do this, we need to do this, we need to do this. And it's so negative about everything. You write bulletproof tests and bulletproof code, but the whole budget for the whole product goes on the first story. Nothing ever goes live. Next to N, fortuitously in the language, is O, which stands for optimism-driven development. This is entirely the opposite. This is where everybody says, no, our code's brilliant. We don't need to test it. We don't need to do that. It'll work. We know it works. It's fine. So it goes live, that product, within a few days, and then it just goes on fire. The world sets on fire, and it ends badly for another reason. P, we have patterns-driven development. Now, that book's actually very good. I recommend it. However, what I don't recommend is when people refuse to write a single line of code before they have argued and argued and argued about what pattern they're going to implement for this. Just start writing it. Get on with it. 
So as far as I'm concerned, patterns-driven development is an anti-pattern. You also have politics-driven development, which is when the politics in the company dictates what you do as a group. So it doesn't matter what the most important thing is, whoever is shouting the loudest or whoever the tech lead or the product owner needs to keep happy to get a promotion, that's what you do. Q, well, I was struggling on Q when we did the alphabet. It stands for QA dif driven development. It's definitely a thing as far as I'm concerned. Um, but when we looked it up uh, and I Googled for it, it turned out everybody calls it tester driven development. So, but you know, we already had stuff for T, so we put it in Q. Oh, and there's the explanation. R, what does R stand for? Well, it's the .NET version of INJ. S, Stack Overflow driven development. Everybody's done this. You go onto Stack Overflow, you find a solution, you test it, you bring it into your stuff, you, there it is in your code base. You can tell when people are doing this because every now and again you'll see a comment that says, I don't really know what this line does, but I got it from Stack Overflow and if I take it out, it doesn't work. It also stands for sales driven development, which is very much like marketing driven development. This happened to me loads when I was working for a startup. Our CEO went out and sold stuff to people. And then he'd come back into the office, he's had this big meeting with this big company, he's made a partnership, he'd come back in and say, oh yeah, this is what I sold them. We, we have to do this, this and this. We can do that, right? And we'd all go, oh God. <laughs> TDD, say no more. You, well. This is underwear-driven development. If you work in a distributed team, what you find is that a lot of people actually just get out of bed in the morning but kind of don't get out of bed. You can tell who's still wearing their pants and hasn't got dressed yet because when you do your stand-up and everybody dials in, they're the ones with the black screen that just say John's iPhone. They're still in their pants. Value-driven development is a thing. Waterfall-driven development used to be a thing and I sincerely hope people don't do it anymore, but maybe they do. Some people pretend they don't, but they do. I know that much. And there's also agile driven development, which is, oh God. You see this a lot in the UK in, in public sector bodies. They claim to be agile. They're not. I've got a whole talk about that tomorrow. Quick plug. X. These two gentlemen are XDs from ThoughtWorks. XD driven development is a thing where your, your product starts off and it's a great thing where the XDs go out and do great research and do a lot of research, do focus funnels, everything like that. You really understand what you're building before it gets going. Um, I can't find much evidence of it, but I've done it on, on one client and it was fantastic. Why? I ain't gonna need that slide. And Z finally, stands for zealot driven development, which is there is one person in your team that absolutely drives everybody on. No matter what is going on, that person forces everybody to do it and do it and do it and do it right, which is actually how we managed to get an A to Z done in, in one drinking session. So that's, that's the A to Z. So when we posted this and people started talking about it, actually we started asking this question about what are these things? Do these things make sense? Are they in any way sensible? I think we all agree that TDD is sensible. BDD is probably sensible. Most of these things, you know, a lot of them that we're not explaining dysfunctionally are sensible. So we, I decided to, once I put the talk in, I thought, well, I've got to make up some kind of sensible message. I can't just go through an A to Z, which is obviously joking. So here's, here's all the things that I mentioned. Um, I think... Uh, I think there's 40 or 41 of them, and this is the original list that we came up with during the one day. And I thought to myself, well, what, what do they mean? How can I group these things together? So my first idea was this, and I hope everybody can see, we've got good ideas in green and bad ideas in red. So how does that end up grouping? Well, you don't need to be able to read these, although that looks like you probably can read them. I won't give you much time to read those because it doesn't really matter. So, okay, I looked at that and thought, all right, fine. So then I thought, okay, what about, because obviously we made some of this stuff up to explain some work, explain some stuff. So what about the real things that you can Google versus the made up stuff? What does this look like? So I grouped them all together again. And if you've got really sharp eyes or you're a mega fast reader, you'll notice that there was a very strong correlation between those two previous slides won't go into the exact detail. And then I thought there's something else going on here, which is I thought that there were three sort of functional groups. There's a load of stuff about how we build things. There's a load of stuff about what stuff to build. And there's a load of stuff about which technologies to use. 
which I put off to the side. So if we see where everything pops in there, and again, between the green box here and the red box here, there's actually a very strong correlation to the earlier green and red boxes. So, so I thought, OK, all this stuff here about which technologies to use, I think sometimes they're a good idea, sometimes they're a bad idea. So I'm just going to throw those away for this discussion. And then I looked again and I thought, all right, so now, what we got in the top half, let's take all the silly things out of this. So what happens? I think we lose Fowler, we lose Lifestyle, Patterns, and Zealot. So we didn't lose much out of that group. Then, if we look at the what to build stuff, and we take the actual, take the sensible things out of there, what happens? Oh, we only lose two. The only sensible things there are value-driven and Moscow-driven. That's interesting. So, what have we got? We've got loads of sensible ideas about how to build stuff, and loads of frankly crazy, stupid ideas about what it is that we're going to build next. Why? You can see this is a cheap presentation, can't you? So, here's my hypothesis. When it comes to ideas about how to build stuff, we, the developers, the people in this room, we have always been the ones driving those decisions. We're the ones that write the code. We're the ones that live with the code. I think almost all those things that we can do there, TDD especially, behavior driven, they're all invented by developers. We know what we're doing. We know how to build stuff. So leave the developers alone to carry on deciding. You know, product owner's not going to tell you to use TDD, right? That person doesn't, doesn't understand that. On the other hand, when it comes to what we build, I think throughout the history, even in my working lifetime, the last 20, 25 years, we didn't even have product owners 25 years ago. The decision on what it was that we were going to build, how we prioritize, has changed, it's morphed over time, and it's not always clear. So I think there needs to be a better way of deciding what to do. So me being me, I have to come up with a quick decision. How should we decide what to build? And this is really my message to take away. Um, it's a bit of a cheap shot, but I'm going to do it anyway. I say, number one, arrange your teams around customer-facing outcomes. Sounds simple, but many places don't do it. Number two, decouple your teams so that team A can do stuff without team B being around. Number three, get a decent product owner and trust them to get on with it. The product owner, all they need to do, I think, as far as the team is concerned, is say, OK, the most important thing now is that. No more. You don't need to waste time estimating. You don't need to waste time deciding and doing all these games. So number five, do what it is that you were told to do. Number six, go back to step four. And as far as I'm concerned, that should be what drives your development. And if you do that, everybody should be happy, I hope. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> And please rate me. That's, that's the slide from Belgium last week. They didn't give us a slide in the Ukraine, but it's the same branding. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody.